I'm super excited today to bring you guys the very first iteration of a new series called Tales from the Squat Rack. The idea being that I'm sitting here in my squat rack and I'm telling you guys stories of extraordinary people that have achieved extraordinary feats of strength, athleticism, or endurance. It could be people from history or people from modern times. Also, I'm trying to get a bit more production quality here. So I've got this uh, little microphone on me. Hopefully the audio quality is nice. And also if you see me looking down at all, I've got some notes here that I'm gonna be consulting uh, since there's so much to cover and I want to make sure I stay on track. So anyway, without any further ado, let's get into the very first episode. Today we are talking about David Goggins. If you haven't heard of this man yet, he has done some truly incredible things in his life, including running uh, 240 miles in one day, which is nearly 400 kilometers. And he's also done over 4,000 pull-ups in one day. But that's just scratching the surface. And before we get into all that, let's rewind a little bit and let's talk about where he came from and how he became the man he is today. So David Goggins was born in Buffalo, New York in 1975, but unfortunately he was born into a very bad household. His father was abusive. Uh, he would beat uh, David and his mother, and he was just overall a really bad guy. So he would also um, traffic prostitutes from Canada down to New York and the father also had another business which was an ice skating rink and in this ice skating rink he would actually put Goggins to work from a very young age so the father had very little interest in Goggins uh, schooling or him getting any sort of education he just wanted him to work uh, in the family's business and you know get some productivity out of the kid so from a young age, we're talking like five, six years old, uh, Goggins was working every day at this ice skating rink. So from about 7 p.m. to midnight, uh, he was working, he was taking care of people's skates, he was cleaning up. And then when midnight would roll around and his shift would end, uh, Goggins wouldn't just head on home and get a good night's sleep. Um, Unfortunately, there was a bar uh, that was also a part of this establishment. So people would skate and then after they skate, they would go to the bar. So Goggin's mother would be the one working in the bar and serving people. So all Goggin's mother could do uh, was quickly give Goggin some food and then get him to sleep in the actual establishment in a little office they had there. That's where he would sleep. And meanwhile, the mother would go work in the bar, which was right next to him. And up until the early hours of the morning, people were partying. There was loud music, lots of noise, and Goggins couldn't get any sleep at all. So not only would he, you know, be going to school and then be coming and working all evening, but then at night he couldn't even get a good night's rest because of all the noise going on around him. So this was just a horrible environment for a little kid to be growing up, you know, at an age when you should have no cares in the world, when you should just be having fun and playing, uh, you know, this kid was working, which is just very sad, right? Working and not even getting a good night's sleep at the end of it. So luckily, uh, Goggin's mother had a bit of a plan. And when Goggin's was about eight years old, um, his mother managed to get herself a credit card in her name for the first time. So for the first time, she had some control over some money. And with that, she actually took Goggins and escaped. Uh, so they fled from New York and they went down to Indiana. So luckily, they managed to distance themselves from this bad man, which was a very bad influence in their lives. But at the same time, life was not really easy in Indiana. They had nothing. They had nothing but the shirts on their backs. Um, Goggin's mother got a part-time job, so they had a tiny bit of money that they could scrape by with. Uh, they were living in the projects, you know, in public housing. And also they were in a very white neighborhood. And um, in school, Goggin's was the only uh, black kid. They, they were the only black family in the area really there were only a couple other ones and in school Goggins was the only black kid in his class 
So this was uh, in the 90s. And um, I suppose people probably weren't as progressive as they are now. So unfortunately, Goggins also suffered a lot, a lot of uh, racial discrimination during this time. And uh, it just wasn't a really nice town for him to grow up in uh, because a lot of the people were unfortunately very racist towards him. So not just that, but in school, he also suffered a lot because unfortunately, due to the abuse he, he suffered from his father, he developed a disorder from, from all the trauma and it manifested itself uh, as a learning disability. Uh, he had a lot of trouble in school and also he developed a stutter. He couldn't speak properly. And uh, just from the stress of it all, from the, the anxiety of carrying around all this trauma with him, um, his hair started falling out and his uh, skin pigmentation was changing. Like he had white patches on his skin, just horrible stuff for, for a kid to be suffering. And uh, because of this, a lot of people, they thought he was stupid. They thought there was just something wrong with him. And uh, the teachers weren't much help either. And so in order for Goggins to sort of get by uh, during this point, he started uh, copying. He would copy all his homework. He would copy during the tests. And so he kind of scraped by and, you know, progressed through school, but just by copying. So he wasn't actually learning anything. And actually he made it to high school and he could barely read. Uh, the only reason he got there is because he was just copying everything along the way and the teachers didn't really care, right? So how did he turn all this around? Well, he gets to high school and he gets an interest in the Air Force. So uh, specifically there was, yeah, he wanted to join a division of the Air Force called the Pararescuers. So these were people uh, that would get sort of dropped into locations and they would go rescue uh, downed pilots. So this is what he wanted to do. But uh, in order to join this division of the Air Force, uh, Goggins needed to learn how to swim. And he was absolutely terrified of the water. And also he would sink. So a lot of people don't know, but um, black people often have a higher bone density. And so actually they don't uh, float like me if I get into the water and I don't do anything I just kind of float around in the water But that's not the case for a lot of black people They have a higher bone density so when they get in the water they just sink and this was actually the case for Goggins So he was terrified of the water and it was very difficult for him to learn how to swim uh, Because every time he got in the water he would just sort of sink so that was a prerequisite to joining the division he was interested in so Unfortunately, he just couldn't get past his fear of the water. And so he moved into another division of the Air Force for a time uh, and he worked there for a while. But eventually during a routine medical checkup, they found that he had a predisposition to a blood disease. And so he used that sort of as an excuse to just uh, quit the military entirely. And uh, that was it for his military career at that point. So that brings us up to the late 90s. And uh, at this point, uh, Goggins is in his early 20s. Uh, he's finished his uh, military career for now, and he's actually at work in a pest control company. So what he's doing at this point is just going around to restaurants, and he's literally chasing down cockroaches. So he's going to these like dirty restaurants, He's, you know, looking underneath things, trying to find the cockroaches and like trying to spray them and kill them. And so this is just, you know, you can imagine this is a pretty gross job. You're chasing cockroaches all day. It's a pretty dead end job. There's no way, nowhere to go from there. He's not making good money. And during this time, he was eating a lot and he was eating really bad food. So his weight actually ballooned. And every day he was drinking uh, chocolate milkshakes. He was eating donuts. Uh, tons of cinnamon rolls and uh, his weight actually ballooned up to 300 pounds. So yeah, I mean from the moment for the moment things are just going bad, 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 bad in, in the life of uh, our friend David Goggins here. But let's see how he sort of turns it around. So one of the big uh, turning points in his life uh, was when he was watching TV one night and he sees a documentary 
about the Navy SEALs. So I'm sure you guys have heard of the Navy SEALs. You know, they're an elite uh, division in the United States Navy, one of the most, you know, hardcore guys in the world, right? And he saw this documentary about how they would train and he was just, it sparked something in him. It lit a fire and for the first time, he was super motivated and there was nothing he wanted more in life than to become a Navy SEAL. So over the next couple of weeks, he starts making calls. He's calling uh, Navy recruiters all over the country, trying to get himself into uh, Navy SEAL training. But every time he talks to a recruiter, the conversation eventually leads them to his weight. And once they find out that he weighs 300 pounds, uh, most of them just hang up on him because how are you gonna be a Navy SEAL if you're you know, obese and you weigh 300 pounds? So that didn't deter him. He kept calling, he kept calling, and eventually uh, he found a recruiter that told him about a program for uh, previously enlisted uh, military uh, members that could come back to the military and join the Navy SEALs in this uh, program that they were running. So this was Goggin's chance since he had a previous military record uh, to get into the Navy SEALs, but uh, there was a caveat. He had to weigh no more than 191 kilos. And at this time he weighed nearly 300 kilos. So he had over 100 pounds to lose and this program was actually ending uh, very shortly. He had less than three months to make it into this program because they were cutting the program and he had to lose over 100 pounds and this was his only chance to get into the Navy SEALs. So some would say that that's impossible. Most would give up at this point and the people around him were telling him there's no way you're gonna lose 100 pounds in three months, over 100 pounds. But Goggins wasn't deterred. He started a excruciating fitness uh, training regimen. And I'm gonna tell you guys a little bit about that. So he would wake up at 4.30 in the morning. He would start with two hours on the stationary bike. Then he would hit up the pool and he would do two hours of swimming in the pool. So even though he didn't like the water, he was bad at swimming, he knew if he wanted to become a Navy SEAL, he had to be comfortable in the water. He had to spend as much time in the water as possible. So he would get in the pool every day. He would practice, he would swim two hours every day in the pool. Then he would go to the gym and he would start training with weights and he would try to do 200 reps at least for every muscle group. So obviously he wasn't training uh, super heavy. Um, his his uh, motivation was more the weight loss. So he would just get in the gym and just do a ridiculous amount of reps, right? 200 reps for every muscle group. Then he would do another two hours on the bike. Then he would have dinner and he would do another two hours on the bike, all of this in the same day, right? I mean, just imagine doing this day after day as a 300 pound man. But as you can imagine, uh, the weight started coming off very quickly. And within a couple weeks, he actually added a four mile daily run onto this routine that he was already doing every day. So a very, very extreme challenge for this man. Um, but he actually manages to lose the weight. And in under three months, he loses over a hundred pounds, which in, in itself is an extraordinary feat. Um, so he makes it into the program, but it doesn't get any easier from there because if you know anything about uh, Navy SEAL training, these guys, they go through something called BUDS and it is just the most excruciating uh, training that you could possibly imagine. If you haven't seen anything about it, I recommend you look up a documentary, um, see how these guys train. It really is intense and specifically when you get started uh, in, the, in the Navy SEAL training, the first thing you do is something called Hell Week. So for the first week, you basically get no sleep. If I remember correctly, it's like literally one to two hours of sleep for the entire week. You know, not per day. You're sleeping like two hours over the course of a week. And during the whole time, they're putting you in water. They're putting you underwater, cold water. You're doing grueling physical activity, you know, moving logs and boats and carrying stuff. And 
it's just horrendous and it's non-stop and you're not sleeping and it's just for an entire week they try to break down every fiber of your being. So Goggins is going through this and um, unfortunately he suffers uh, several injuries during Hell Week, uh, several stress fractures all over his body and he just can't continue. Um, so he gets cut from Hell Week um, his first try, but he's not he's not uh, deterred. He goes back for a second try and goes back to Hell Week again. And uh, unfortunately, the second time he actually gets pneumonia in his lungs. So, I mean, it's just unthinkable. But first time he's like breaking himself. The second time he gets this uh, pneumonia in his lungs and he actually goes back to Hell Week for a third time. So in one year, in the same year, this man has gone through Hell Week three times, which is just crazy. I mean, this is probably one of the most intense, painful, grueling things that a human can experience. And he's done it three times in the same year. But third time's the charm, and he actually makes it through this time, and he becomes a Navy SEAL. So at this point, we are in 2001, and we all know what happens in 2001. So after 9-11, he gets deployed. Uh, to Iraq, uh, where he serves as a trainer for other Navy SEALs. But we're not going to talk too much about his military career because I'm more interested in sort of the fitness aspect here. So the next sort of interesting point is in 2005, uh, there's unfortunately a helicopter crash in combat in Afghanistan and uh, 12 Navy SEALs are killed. And uh, Goggins actually knew every single one of these SEALs. Uh, he had trained with some of them. Some of them were actually with him uh, in Hell Week. So he had a close connection to these people. Um, and in order to try and raise some money for, his, uh, for these families of these fallen soldiers, he decided to do some running. He wanted to become, a, he wanted to do an ultra marathon in order to raise money for these families. So uh, his idea was to do this uh, ultra marathon called Bad, Bad Water 135, which is a 135 mile run in Death Valley, which if you don't know about Death Valley, this is a desert in the United States, and it is basically one of the hottest places on this planet. And this run is done in July in Death Valley, and it starts at sea level and it ends at 8,000 feet. So you also have this big elevation change and it's a 135 mile run, right? But it's an invitational, so you can't just sign up to it. You have to get invited. And in order to get invited, you have to prove that you're able to run 100 miles in a 24 hour period. So Goggins, at this point, is a big boy. He has actually gotten very strong. Obviously, he is a Navy SEAL, so he's working out a lot. He's lifting a lot of heavy weights. He's got a lot of muscle on him and he weighs 250 pounds. So he's a big, muscular, strong guy, which is not what you would think would be conducive to running a shitload of miles, right? Usually these uh, ultra marathon guys, they're super skinny, right? They don't, they're not carrying around a lot of muscle because they don't need it. It just weighs them down. So, um, Goggins has an opportunity to prove that he can do these uh, 100 miles within uh, one day because there is a marathon in San Diego close by where he can run 100 miles. But the thing is, as I said, he weighs a lot and also he, he wasn't doing any cardio. He was training with weights, but the only cardio he was doing was once per week he would do 20 minutes on the elliptical. So just think about this for a second. With three days notice, you're joining a 100 mile run as a 250 pound piece of muscle who has no cardio training whatsoever. So he, he actually does the run and about halfway through, he poos his pants 
he starts peeing himself. He's peeing blood. This is how hardcore it is. His feet are just covered in blisters. But because he's gone through Hell Week three times, you know, he's incredibly strong mentally at this point, even though his body wasn't really conditioned for this. Out of pure grit and pure willpower, he managed to push himself through, even though he was literally covered in his own feces and in his urine and covered in his blood. He managed to actually complete uh, the 100 miles in that one day. And um, then he got invited to this Badwater um, Marathon, this Badwater 135, uh, which he went to the next year in 2006. So for this one, he does actually train hard and he does uh, several marathons before that. Uh, but in 2006, he goes to this Badwater uh, Marathon and he does it. He does 135 miles of running in under 30 hours and he comes in fifth place. So just, just think about this. This is one of the most elite running competitions on the planet. You're in Death Valley. This guy has just a year ago has ran his first marathon and he joins this absolutely insane marathon, 135 miles, and he comes in fifth place, you know, competing against world-class people. And, and he actually gets a good placement. So that was just the beginning for, for him. He really fell in love with uh, ultra marathons. And from, uh, from then on, he kept running in 2007. He ran nine ultra marathons in that one year. Uh, one of those ultra marathons was 205 miles, which he completed in under 39 hours. And the crazy thing is, during this whole time, it turns out he actually had a hole in his heart. So he had this uh, genetic condition, which uh, there was a physical hole, apparently the size of a quarter in his heart. And the doctors were absolutely flabbergasted when they find, found out the kinds of things that this guy was doing. You know, the seal training, the running. They were amazed that he was alive. He could have dropped dead at any moment from what he was doing. So they actually had to crack him open and he had to get a heart surgery to plug this hole in his heart and to try and fix it. So he has heart surgery and uh, he goes back in six months to get a checkup for his heart surgery. And uh, they do some tests and whatnot and they actually find out that uh, the surgery wasn't a success. It didn't actually fix the problem completely. So he has to get a second heart surgery. But before he can get that, um, he needs to wait another six months for like his heart to heal completely from the first surgery. And then he's gonna get a second heart surgery. But the crazy thing is that this guy is still running in between these two surgeries. He knows He's just had heart surgery. He still has a hole in his heart and he's about to have another heart surgery and this guy's still running. He was actually at this time, he was training to join the Delta Force in the military. And uh, for this, he was doing ruck runs. So he was putting on a backpack that was full of weights and he was running for hours at a time with a hole in his heart just before doing heart surgery. In fact, he did one of these ruck runs the very day he was going in for his second heart surgery, he did a ruck run that same day. Absolutely mental, this guy, absolutely crazy. Um, so he has ran over 60 marathons uh, since he started. Um, yeah, I forgot to mention that his second heart surgery was a success, luckily. They sorted it all out. His heart's good to go. He's 100%, right? So. He's ran over 60 marathons uh, since he started, and he's also competed in other uh, long distance stuff, including ultra cycling, where you cycle for a very long distance, and triathlons, where you cycle, uh, swim, and run, all in the same uh, competition. So that's some of the uh, long distance stuff he's done, but he's also achieved another crazy feat, which I mentioned in the beginning, and that was in 2013, he wanted to break the world record for the most pull-ups in one day. 
And at the time, the record was 4,020 pull-ups in one day. And so Goggins, he trained, he trained, he trained. I think he did over 40,000 pull-ups uh, in his training uh, during the couple months leading up to his uh, attempt. He did over 40,000 pull-ups to train for this. And then he had uh, one attempt, which didn't go so well. He had another attempt, which also didn't go so well. But finally, on the third attempt, he managed to break this record and he did 4,030 pull-ups in 17 hours. So um, once he broke the record, he stopped, he did 10 more and that's it. Um, so in 17 hours, 4,030 pull-ups, which comes out to an average of four pull-ups per minute. I mean, just think about that. Four pull-ups every single minute for 17 hours. That's absolutely insane. And also, he ripped his hands completely to shreds while doing these pull-ups. And it's not like he ripped his hands on rep 4029. He ripped his hands early on and, and he continued, you know, with his destroyed hands. It, it turns out that he had like the equivalent of third degree burns on both of his palms from doing these pull-ups. But he didn't stop. He, you know, he completed it and got the world record, uh, even having destroyed his hands in the process. So uh, just the final uh, feat of athleticism from this guy. In 2020, he did uh, his most impressive run, which is a marathon called Moab 240. And this is a 240-mile run non-stop 240 miles which is nearly 400 kilometers and he completed that in 2020 at the age of 45 in 62 hours and 21 minutes so that's everything i have on david goggins uh, feats of athleticism he's done many more things and uh, if you're interested in that, he's got a book and he's been on many podcasts, including Joe Rogan. So you can go listen to him speak. He's incredibly motivating. And it's just crazy the amount of adversity that this guy had, you know. He just came from absolutely nothing and through pure willpower and pure work ethic, he's managed to sort of, you know, pull himself up from his bootstraps and just do some absolutely incredible things. So not just you know his long uh, career in the military, but all these crazy challenges that he poses to himself. And still uh, to this day, he works out like an absolute madman. I mean, every single day he's got a crazy regime, he's running, it's nonstop. You know, this guy's in his 40s and he's in incredible shape. It is super impressive. I really recommend you look him up. Uh, he's got lots of great quotes. Just listening to this guy is so inspirational. It really gets you fired up. And, uh, you know, for sure, you're going to be motivated uh, listening to David Goggins. So if you're not, um, you know, consuming his content yet, I recommend you do that. Go listen to some of his podcasts. And, uh, yeah, that's all I've got for you guys today with my very first episode of Tales from the Squat Rack. I hope you enjoyed it. I really put a lot of effort into this. So if you're interested in seeing more of these uh, episodes, then please do let me know. And if you'd be kind enough to share this video with a friend who might enjoy it, that would also be great. Uh, if this gets a good response, I'll be much more motivated to do more videos like this. So thank you for watching and see you in the next one.